For the last time, I am sick and tired of watching how it's made. Sliver shouted from her bunk. It was movie night, and they were debating what to watch again. Well, I'm not going to sit through another one of your synth operas. I know our human bodies can't hear the sub vocals needed to understand it. Ventures forth Paris. Cookie shrugs. I'm fine with that. You would be, Milk replied with a giggle. Well, if we're still debating this, I think I have a solution. A movie I know we'll all like. She holds up a picture of a grizzled man with a firm jawline, stubble and a leather hat, holding a whip with English text emblazoned above it, in an adventurous typeset. Cookie laughs. Oh, you can definitely pick him. Milk smiles. Indiana Jones never goes wrong. Formerly Fleet Admiral Rochelle was brought to the bridge of her new ship in chains. It still wasn't the worst way she had been introduced to a new crew. At least she wasn't bleeding this time. She could hear her escorts rattle off some legalese as they removed the chains. Yes, I understand. Now, Captain Rochelle said to her wardens, I am to act as commander of this vessel with distinction and honour, and not shame the Imperium again. Competence is a crime, it seems. She looked back to the bridge crew, staring at her in silent anticipation. They most definitely have heard the rumours about her. The stories, the lies, and the truth. And most definitely the song. I am your captain, she began. I take this position with the knowledge it was meant as an insult. I do not see it this way. To lead women and men in their duty is the greatest blessing I could have ever been given. I accept this charge and gift, and will ensure this ship serves with pride and discipline. The half strength ship was undergoing refits after a clash with pirates left them damaged and missing crew. They won, but at high cost. Most captains wouldn't want to risk a fresh crew in a fresh ship so soon, but Captain Goddess Damned Rochelle wasn't most captains. She began to pace, hands clasped firmly behind her back. You have weathered pain and damage, and I promise nothing but more of the same. You have served admirably and fought hard, and I have no gifts but further service and conflict. If there are any who would wish to serve on another ship, I have nothing against you. We are docked, and I will deny no transfer request. You know my reputation. That I throw my sailors into fights without hope and drag victory from the depths of defeat. That I do not bring all my sailors back alive, but I bring them back victorious. That my heart is nothing but frozen clay and war. That may as well be true. She paused her pacing at the dead centre of the bridge, turning to her guards, who had become increasingly worried looking. I am Captain Rochelle, and I have the helm. Soldiers, get the fuck off my ship. The two interior goons quickly rushed to leave as the crew cheered for their new captain. Rochelle's mind was elsewhere as she began to look over the service records and recommendations for crew replacements. A message appeared, one from an old friend. It carried four profiles and a request. An interceptor crew, a gunnery tech, and an engineer. Give us our wings. Captain Rochelle looked at the readouts of her new ship and stood, thinking, on the bridge of the Imperium patrol vessel dearer than gold and smiled. All right, Senwin. Let's see what you've got for me, you old ace. Uh, one, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three, Cookie said, holding Ventures forth tight, one hand holding a hand of hers, the other resting on the small of her back. A familiar song echoed through the maintenance bay as the crew took a short break from doing their homework. In patrol doctrine, Interceptor pilots should know the basics of how to repair their fighter craft, so while passing repair courses are not required to graduate from training, it's highly suggested they sit in when the engineers are repairing their craft, or in the case of Ryan Kennedy, who loved machines, and Ivy McDermott, who was more or less born with a wench in her hands, scoring higher on the midterms than some of the dedicated engineer cadets to the instructor's amusement. But nobody can be 100% business all the time, so on um, more or less of a whim, McDermott put on some classical music, and Kennedy decided to teach Finch's Forth how to properly waltz. It was going better than expected, if he was honest. He hadn't waltzed since Scotillion when he was in middle school, and once during the Navy Ball, but he still remembered the steps drawn into his head, and was able to teach the Gearshard how to make the steps. The fact that Finch's Forth braved into fast unknowns had computer-enhanced balance and reaction time didn't hurt. And one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three... While a handful of engineers and pilots cheered at the dancers, four other sure attempted to follow Cookie in learning the steps, with dubious results while the music filled the room with a refined sound of strings. They really look good, don't they? Milk asks. Yeah, they do, Slivers replies. 
We didn't look that good, Milk states. No, we really didn't, Slivers confirms. The pair lapses into silence for a stretch as they lay on the engineering room floor, tangled up like nothing else. Snake shouldn't waltz. The scale of history is a funny thing. Even that phrase is a funny one. How do you define history? Local, regional, federal, governments and nations? Or do you expand even further and touch on planets and empires and galaxies? Can you have a history truly independent of other peoples? In histories of galaxies, can you talk about Bronze Age Egypt without also mentioning the Shorvanti Queens fighting for dominance however many light years apart? Can you talk about the space race of humanity and the first probing expeditions by the Alliance in the same breath? And how much worth is there in single people when compared to history as a whole? Sure, there are empresses who order armies to march and planets to burn. Sure, there are visionaries who raise the hearts and wrath of civilians. Sure, there are the firebrands who turn empires over into war. There are the CEOs who guide companies and officers who lead companies. There are special agents who change political climates with bullets and knives. There are rabble rousers who do the same with mobs. But what about those who are none of them? Compared to history as a whole, how much worth is there in a single person? Not even an officer. As the corpse of a missing militia woman was dug up under a ruined parking garage in Kentucky, the question has to be asked. How important is the discovery of a single body that someone would rather leave hidden? So what's got you sticking your nose into the iPad? Milk asks, walking past Cookie. She just finished doing maintenance with Ventures 4, so her fingernails were caged with machine lubricant, and the Irish lady was actively wiping the stuff from her right hand. Armless Slade. Cookie eyely corrected. We're in the Imperium, might as well use the correct terminology, even if we're speaking English. Well, la dee da! Looking at porn on it then? Milk replied, finally giving up and grabbing some soap to begin breaking down the grease staining her fingers. Cookie looked over and gave a look at his fellow pilot. Please, doubt I could find what I like in the Imperium in particular. Bible World? Touche, but my point stands. I've been looking into the history of this illustrious Imperium we found ourselves in. Heroes, villains, wars, you know, the normal stuff. That caught Milk's attention. Out of everything else, the pair were utter history nerds. Anything stand out as neat? I figured out why they're having so many problems with Earth's cultures, he idly replied. They've more or less had a single culture to a single planet since, well, the dates are weird, but far back enough I can call it ancient history. Empire ended up taking everything over, and by the time they expanded out into the stars, there was a... He cleared his throat. United people ready to strive together towards the stars. Staying sponsored Wikipedia is a trip. Milk laughed at that. Then, sorry, that's just... Right. Then why do we have the weird periphery stuff? And not just the periphery. Periphery. Just the rim worlds. Well, to put it simply, Ryan said, letting Milk lean in. Official history is full of shit. That sent the WSO off in fits of laughter again. They had nations, yeah, plenty of them. And every one of these nations had space agencies racing for new colonies. Apparently something about keeping the remnants of kingdoms with each other to promote unity or some BS. But what that did was, well... He spun around the tablet to show off a name. New, now just Sevastatav. More or less, Shovanti Russia. The queen that used to rule the territory was notoriously iron-handed and had to put down a handful of revolutions. The people are hardy sons of bitches with fatalism and are leaning towards stubbornness. During the... he checked. The first war refusal, when more or less some colonists decided that they didn't want to pay taxes. As one does. Yes, yes, proper American tradition. Anyway, this was before the Shul had really figured out how to beat people to death from orbit. So the Shulvanti Expeditionary Force ended up planet hopping and taking each colony one by one. Savasotav was the last one in line, but instead of just giving up, they dug in. Ended up forcing the shield to come out to the negotiation table since they more or less got bored fighting them. Still fly their independent flag alongside the Imperiums. Sounds like Texas. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, there is some interesting shit in here when you start reading between the lines and looking into the sources. Milk shrugged. I mean, it's about for many thousands of years of industrial age history. The stuff tends to happen all at once and gets recorded. If Sabaton ever decided to start shilling for the shill, seems like they had plenty of stuff to pull from. Cookie nods. Yeah, still. Speaking of, I was able to put a priority on a data download for their new stuff. Interested? Damn straight I am. Blast it! Milk says with a laugh. Talfin and Semwin lay in bed together. 
The night was quiet and an open window let in the warm air. They rested against each other, the quiet soothing nose worn thin. She replied, Semwin said, a propos of nothing. Who, dear? Tarfin asked. Fleet Admiral, or rather I should say Captain Rochal, she replied. She said she was interested in reacquiring one of her old interceptor crews, but the others... She can't take a gamble on an unsure thing, an unproven interceptor and some random crew, not something easy to justify. Semwin nods. She said that she would consider it after seeing the final exam results, which, again, I understand, but... Means we can't leave until that's done. We didn't plan on it, but... Less choices. The pair fade off back into silence. It was an easy silence. They have said all they said. They knew what the other thought. It would be nice to fly again, Tarfin says quietly. Flying? Flying in combat? Goddesses and shell help me. I want to fly again. Samwin pressed her head into her wife's shoulder. I do too. The void is calling and it's horrible, isn't it? That's not the world I'd use for it. They didn't speak much for the rest of the night, neither willing to break the comforting silence.